Pandas is about a brand new uh, panda reintroduction program uh, that's taking captive-born pandas and preparing them for release into the wild. It's a new method that hopefully will help expand the panda, wild panda population and also help uh, add to the genetic diversity of the wild panda population. Well, I've made uh, quite a few films for IMAX about different animals, orangutans, elephants, and lemurs, but really, pandas is an incredible honor to make a film about pandas because they're just so adorable, they're so precious, and they're so rare, and it's really important that we do everything we can to conserve them in the wild. The way this film began was actually through a man in New Hampshire named Ben Killam, who's a black bear rehabilitator. And Ben is a... You know, he, um, he's dys dyslexic, and he had a very hard time learning in school, so he never had the opportunity to become a scientist, but he always wanted to learn. So Ben um, took it upon himself to become a black bear rehabilitator, and he did this for 20 years, learning everything he could about bears. And then one day, Ben got an opportunity to start working with pandas, which is perhaps the most important conservation issue you know, in, for wildlife. And the idea that here was a man who didn't have so many opportunities in his life because of his learning disability, just worked hard and you know, created his own path to knowledge and success. And now he has this wonderful opportunity you know, to help save the world's pandas. I thought that was a really beautiful story. So I'm the writer of this film, but I actually write it after, uh, once we filmed it. But in bef while we're filming and before, uh, we're always working on the story. So we're always working on what the different scenes are and how we're going to tell the story. But then as far as all the narration, that all comes after, once we've put it together. You know, we're making a nature documentary, and so you never know what's going to happen. So you can't write it first. You know, we, have, we always have to you know, change our plans all the time, depending on what happens. And we always have to reevaluate, where is this movie going, and try to figure it out so we can really tell the best story that we can. It took us about three years to prepare to make this film before we even started filming. And then it took us about three years to make the movie. So it was quite a long time. Ah, there are so many challenges to make a nature film. Um, working in China is a challenge because we had to bring all of our equipment over to China and then you know, we're integrating with the Chinese film crew and that's always interesting. Um, but you know, the hardest thing is always working with wild animals because you never know what they're gonna do. There are no trained animals in this movie. So we, as a film crew, always have to learn what's the best way to get the performance from a wild animal. And for us, that usually meant being as far away as we could and letting the animals be as natural as they can and setting up cameras to operate remotely. The people in this film are a combination of Chinese and American biologists and conservationists. We have uh, Ho Rong, who runs... She, Ho Rong is the director of research at the Chengdu um, research Center for Giant Panda Breeding. And Xiao Bi is another Chinese scientist, uh, Bi Wenlei. He's a Chinese biologist. And then on the American side, there's Jake Owens, who's a conservation biologist, and Ben Killam, who is a black bear researcher in New Hampshire. And so they've all come together to you know, work together on this panda reintroduction program. This film uh, was all shot digitally with IMAX cameras and some 8K RED cameras. And what was really different on this film um, is we were able to really, for the first time, shoot a 3D IMAX with a drone. So we have all this incredible photography um, soaring over uh, gorgeous scenery in China in ways we never would have been able to do before. We're working with very large cameras, but because we're filming um, in 3D, we actually have to be very close to the subject. So we're often you know, just five feet away from all the pandas and all the bears. It's a very intimate experience. When we were making this film, we'd really, we thought it was really important to be able to get the camera where the bears are, up in the trees, the bears and the pandas. So we would use a crane. We'd have the cameras up on a crane that's going up into the trees. Sometimes we'd use a big tower that the, the camera would go up and down. We'd use every tool we could in order to really bring the most accurate experience to the theater. There are a lot of uh, bears in this film that have collars around their neck and those collars um, have a tracking device in them and it enables the scientists to always find the bears and the pandas. That way they can study them and they can follow their behavior and also 
if the bears ever get in trouble, the scientists can go help them. Well, it takes so many people to make a movie. And there's a moment in this film where um, a panda is injured and there's a little uh, rescue mission that goes on to save her. Now, we actually weren't in China at that moment when this happened. Um, but fortunately, um, the rescue team brought a camera along. So the footage you see in the film is the actual footage that they shot themselves of this moment. One thing that's equally important to the quality of the picture in an IMAX film is the sound. So we have uh, you know, a sound recordist who comes out and they're with us the whole time. And when we're busy setting up, they're out in nature just recording all the you know, beautiful sounds of the birds and the natural sounds and the bears and the pandas. Uh, so we spend a lot of time you know, getting all the best animal vocalizations we can. One thing we really want, uh, especially kids, to take away from this movie is that you know, conservation is a real job. If you're interested in working with animals, you can do it. You know, it's very hard work, um, but there are lots of people out there and they've dedicated their lives to working with animals and saving wildlife. And, um, you know, and you should, you should do it. There, <laughs> there's so many opportunities um, to help, you know, make this world a better place for, for wildlife and animals and the environment. And this film showcases some people, you know, who are doing that in a really special way and we hope that inspires other people to get involved in conservation too. We work with rehabilitating black bears in Ontario and returning them to the wild. And this is similar to what they are doing in China with the panda bear. Now the man who's involved with helping the Chinese organization release the pandas back to wild's name is Ben Killam. And I know Ben because uh, we talk black bears quite a bit and Ben lives in the U United States in New Hampshire. So that's where our connection is. There's eight species of bears in the world and panda bears is one of them. And black bears is a species we work with and there's a lot of similarities between the two. Panda bears and black bears have a few differences. Uh, panda bears do not hibernate like black bears do in the wintertime. Panda bears live the summertime high in the mountains and when winter comes, they move down to the valley so they can continue to find something to eat like bamboo. Another difference is that black bears give birth to cubs when they're in hibernation in January. Almost all black bear cubs are born in January, whereas panda bears, baby panda bears are usually born in September, October. A lot of people may assume that because black bears are large, that they're dangerous. Well, that's not really true. They're, they attack and they hurt very, very few people, and almost always the attack can be avoided. I think if you think about a black bear correctly, you would say it's not dangerous at all, even less dangerous than the domestic dog. And panda bears are about the same. Now the thing is though, there's very few pandas in the wild in the world in China, where there's quite a few black bears in the wild in North America, Canada and the USA. There's about 400 to 500,000 black bears in North America, where there's about 2,000 pandas or even less in China. In many parts of Ontario, people live in an area that is where there's bears living as well. So if we know about bears, we can coexist because, like I said before, they're not that dangerous. So why does a bear come around to somebody's house or cottage? Well, there's only one reason, and that's food. And people are not food for bears, but what people eat is what bears love to eat. So if we carefully store our food garbage, bears won't have any reason to come around. And another thing we need to remember, we should not be feeding the birds at all in the summertime, at any time of the day, because birds love bird seed, like sunflower seed. So if a bear comes around, look to see why it's coming around and remove any food attractant that might be the cause of that. If you have any questions, uh, please be, feel free to go to www.bearthus.org. And if you want to email me with a specific question, email info at bearthus.org or org. Everyone. Citizens of Toronto, please come see this movie.